When I reviewed Season 4 of The Dragon Prince, I was more positive on it than a lot of people, and I maintain that positivity, measured as it may be, but what I said is that it feels like the first half of a season. Season 5, for better and worse, appears to be the second half of that season. It seems to be the story of Claudia's growing pursuit of the darkness, her increasing obsession with Erevos, and the image of revival and salvation that he represents. It seems to be the time when Viren will finally break free of Erevos' influences and exert his own individual will, his own love and duty for his daughter, always one of his strongest qualities, will erupt. And whether he survives or not, he seems that he will end Season 5 in a much more moral place than we saw him at a few seasons ago. Raylam seems to be in the process of getting slowly reassembled, and as a passionate fan of that couple, I am happy. As for what else the season may contain, we cannot be sure. Hopefully, the spaces in between these major plot points are dedicated to filling up character outlines, filling up and coloring in the substance of these journeys that the characters are going on, and not just wasting time with trivialities. This does seem to be a darker season, just like Season 4 was, perhaps a little darker even than Season 4, which is a good thing. But to what service is that darkness going? Darkness by itself, of course, does not make a show good. Quite the opposite, a show that starts off with a core of stubborn, impassioned optimism can, if one isn't careful, allow that optimism to decay to such a degree that the show loses its original heart without gaining a new one. The darkness needs to matter. Erevos needs to matter. He needs to not just be this, ooh, I'm so evil kind of villain. He is a puppet master type, and that is potentially interesting, but why is he appealing to those he manipulates? What is the psychological thread connecting him to them? I want to see not just his motivations, explain to us, but his strategy, his approach, his general worldview. There is a touch of the sublime in Erevas's manner at his best. The sublime is a category that has been around for a long time since the era of Longinus, but it was developed into its modern form in the late 18th century. Think about Edmund Burke, think about Kant. Burke talks very eloquently and thoughtfully about the sublime and how it compares to the beautiful. The beautiful is very precise, it's very pretty, it's very orderly, but it's also predictable. It can be stayed, it can be enervating, it can be unnecessarily repetitive. It creates a calming effect. Sure. It creates an impression of ease that can give us peace and serenity, but it does not give us that grandeur of feeling, that intensity, that stark, craggy, desolate immensity. The sublime is the world of myth, it's the world of the ancient, it's the world of the infinite, it's, it's the world of that which far transcends our narrow, limited individual perspective, and as such, 
has this ominous air to it, and yet it is that ominousness that is appealing to us because it frees us, albeit partially from the control of what Nietzsche would later call the Apollonian, the conventions and laws of beauty in all its ideal, intricate, delicate, perfected form. The sublime is night. It's the damp earth. It's the moonlight. It's the wild winds blowing against the desolate mountaintop. It's the absence of facile comfort and so the unleashing of the spirit. If there is an appeal to Erevas, it is to that vast, dark infiniteness. And the hope that it will provide answers, that it can, through that dark, ominous, warped and mysterious and yet somehow alluring world, that it can revitalize our broken senses of self. A little bit of the sublime is useful, it's helpful, it can revitalize us, it can shake us out of our conventions, our routines, our inert customs that we get so easily sucked into, but the sublime can only have that effect if we remain out of danger. When we are in actual visceral danger, whether physical or emotional, the sublime can quickly turn into the simply terrifying. I want there to be that tension about Erevas. I do not need the show to make Erevas sympathetic, necessarily, but I do need a greater sense of why he is so appealing, what he offers those he tempts. While I wouldn't say Bill Cipher, for instance, in Gravity Falls is the best instance of that archetype, we nonetheless have a sense of why he's able to manipulate Ford. Ford is brilliant, yes, but he's also easily frustrated, and he's easily flattered. Bill takes advantage of his ego. Erevas, we saw, took advantage of Viren in early seasons, not because Viren is some idiot, and not because he's some corrupt, power-drunk, megalomaniacal person. He doesn't do the wild villain laughs in his sleep like, ha 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 ha. No. He's just desperate. He's lost everything he cares about. He doesn't have Harrow, he doesn't have Sarai. He feels that dark magic is a refuge for him, that it can give him what he needs in a world that so often denies him what he is after. So it makes sense that he would turn to it, and it makes sense for the same reasons that he would turn to Erevas. There is this emphasis that Erevas is so evil, and he's the cause of all these bad things that happen that we get in Season 4 through Zubeya, and we get a bit in the trailer, and I really hope the show doesn't lean too heavily on that idea that Erevas is somehow making people do all of these horrible, horrible things that they otherwise would not have done. I'm not saying Erevas is not a bad influence, but Erevas is not... some sort of grotesque figure corrupting a morally pure world. He works in the same way that Mephistopheles and Faust works, because he takes advantage of desires and yearnings that are there already. These desires exist in all of us to a certain extent. They are simply stronger in some people than they are in others. I've been reading a lot of Adler, 
these last few days. And one thing he emphasizes, especially in his later work, is this lack of pathologization, this desire to not think of the bad person or the deviant as some sort of outlier from humanity. Instead, they are victims of these same desires, these inferiority complexes, these desires for superiority coming from the tragic broken lives that we all have. These desires are the same in most people, they're just stronger and less tamed in those who eventually do go down a dark path. Claudia is a great way for the show to emphasize this point if it wants to. We know Claudia. We saw her back in the early seasons of the show. She's not some sort of horrible person, but n neither is she some grandiose saint who's been corrupted by the devilish Erevas. She is a quirky, cutesy, unbalanced person. She's a bit selfish. She's a bit greedy at times. She finds herself in season four having little left. She is little binding herself to the world she left behind. And so she's staring out into the darkness of Erevas, in part because she is convinced by a lot of Erevas's arguments, but in part because she does not feel any pull calling her back to the other side. Zorin perhaps could have done a little more to try to help her before he left, but it's probably too late for her now. It's, if nothing else, too late to stop her from going down a dark path. Claudia is a bit like Odysseus in Tennyson's poem. Sick with restlessness and the sense of profound unease, unable to be at home in a world that should be home, a world that should feel like home, and feeling this intense, unebbing longing for the mysterious and the infinite as the only nourishment that will satiate this burning longing, even though she understands to a certain extent that this isn't good, that this isn't necessarily right in all the ways, but she's just so monomaniacally obsessed with this longing and this desperate, haunting yearning of a desolate spirit. Viren, also filled with longing, but of a different sort, wants to pull her back. I don't necessarily want Viren to become a member of our good heroic team, and I don't think it would fit him as a character for him to make that kind of complete transformation, but I do want him to be obsessed with trying to retrieve Claudia. He deeply loves Claudia. He deeply cares for Claudia. He deeply wants Claudia back. He wants to snatch her from the abyss of annihilation that is going to consume her if she continues down the path of being a votary of Erevas. Will he be able to? It's a difficult, tense question, and Viren's story once again looks like it's going to be the most interesting of all the stories we see in Season 5 of The Dragon Prince. But I do hope that this season gives us the catharsis that we have all been looking for. I think it might. So anyway, thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can, if you want to see more videos like this before anyone else. What do you want from Season 5 of The Dragon Prince? What are you expecting? Put your thoughts down in the comments below. I'm interested. Anyway, tune in soon for my next analysis. It will be coming shortly. That I promise you. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.